Hello everybody, back again for uh, another daily message, looking outside today and uh, at least the sun has been shining and a little bit of the snow has gone away, but anyway, sitting here in the house and uh, looking outside and, and just dreaming about being out there again and doing our stuff, but uh, today I want to give uh, another little bit of a, a message, a little bit of a uh, talk of encouragement, you know, based on where we are, especially um, living this day of fear and anxiety. Um, you know, with an uncertain certain future for sure. Uh, I'm a war buff, so to speak. I like the war movies. I guess I'm into that like hero moment, uh, seeing the sacrifice of people. So during this time, Kathy and I have been uh, re-watching the uh, HBO series, The Band of Brothers. And uh, it's about um, a group of paratroopers, Easy Company from the 101st Airborne Division and uh, their exploits in uh, World War II. Anyway, we have come to this part where there's this long siege at Bastogne and uh, it's really, really difficult and Easy Company has been out for a long time and the book records this part which you see in the movie and I, I just want to read from the book Band of Brothers just for a second. Um, he's talking about the topsy-turvy world of combat and uh, the author uh, writes this, there is a limit to how long a man can function effectively in this topsy-turvy world. For some, mental breakdown comes early. Army psychiatrists found that in Normandy, between 10 and 20% of the men in the rifle companies suffered some sort of mental disorder during their first week and either fled or had to be taken out of the line. For others, visible breakdowns never occur, but nonetheless, effectiveness breaks down. The experience of men in combat produces emotions stronger than civilians can know, emotions of terror, panic, anger, sorrow, bewilderment, helplessness, uselessness, and each of these feelings drained energy and mental stability. Now, I, I know we're not uh, fighting a, a known enemy, but I read that list of emotions in this book and thought a lot of that's where we live today. A lot of that is how we're struggling through this pandemic. The author goes on to say, there's no such thing as getting used to combat. The army psychiatrist stated that in an official report in the, that each moment of combat imposes a strain so great that men will break down in direct relation to the intensity and duration of their exposure. Psychiatric casualties were inevitable as a gunshot or shrapnel wounds in warfare. So this is why I say this, as the strain of this time goes on, the sequestering, the unknown future, that strain is going to produce, and this is what they're talking about, that constant pressure produces breakdowns. So what do we do as believers to, to counter that? Well, I want to camp for the next couple, three days uh, that we give these daily messages. I want to camp in Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, uh, these four verses, I want to just pick them apart and each day just talk about one piece of these four verses. Paul writes, rejoice in the Lord always. That's Philippians 4, 4. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, whatever is lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. I just want to start today by talking about how Paul who experienced so much difficulty in his life. There wasn't much that Paul didn't encounter. Physically, beatings and tortures, uh, shipwrecks, uh, loneliness, imprisonment. He, he encountered these things, yet he writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. What he's really saying and calling us to in these verses is that this is a call to a, a truth, a bedrock foundation, truth of our life, not a feeling, but a decision to deeply root ourselves in the confidence that God exists, God is in control, and that God is good. Now, he begins this passage, which is a great passage. It, it, it takes into account, especially these difficult times, but he begins by saying it's important that we root our confidence in the goodness of God, that the strength of God, the, the power of God, that we build our, our foundation in the right place. That that foundation 
of rejoicing, that foundation of rejoicing can only be there when we've decided that we trust in the sovereign God, that we don't have to have the answers and that the, the end is not necessarily uh, needed for us, if you will, but the present promise of God, that the end is God's, controls it for each one of us. I, I wanna just tell a story and that'll be the end of it today um, to help bring this point, to help us that those of us that struggle with anxiety and fear, to help us understand when we see God in the proper way, then that really diminishes our anxieties and our fears. So suppose you had a father who was an orthopedic surgeon and um, you sprained your ankle um, walking in the house. You slipped on something and sprained your ankle and you roll around on the floor and you're in pain and everything. And um, you're only 10 years old though and you really don't know what your dad does. You just know that he goes off to the hospital every day. People call him doctor and so forth and so on. So he gets home and he peels back your socks and he looks and you got this tennis ball size, you know, growth coming out of your ankle it looks like. And he says to you, uh, don't worry, you'll be okay. And you, you writhing in pain, you tell him, I'll never walk again, Dad. My, my future is shot. And he says, no, son, you, you don't know. Um, I can take care of this. And it's evident that right now that the son doesn't know what the father does. So the father says, okay, tomorrow I want you to go with me. So the next day they jump in the car together and they head off to the hospital. And while he's at the hospital, telling his uh, son what he does and his son's looking around the office and he sees all of these diplomas and things, his phone rings and he says to his son, scrub up, we're going into surgery. They head into surgery and there he watches his dad repair, rebuild an ankle. And while he's doing the surgery, the nurse comes over and says, man, your dad is amazing at what he does. And you watch this whole reconstructive process happen and he does what you thought no one could do. He repairs this ankle. And you figure it out partway through, even as a 10 year old, you think, wow, my dad can rebuild an ankle. I'm sure he can deal with a sprained one. If we had that picture of God, I think honestly to God, most of our problems are like sprained ankles to an orthopedic surgeon. We see our problems as huge. We see them as life threatening. Maybe they are. But maybe it's because we've lost focus in, in the size of our God, that the sovereignty of God, that the orthopedic surgeon can take care of our sprained ankle. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. As we struggle through this time of fear, let us start to combat our fear and, in our, and our anxiety by rejoicing in God, rejoicing in the goodness of God and trusting that our God can handle our problems.